I, Richard Nixon, do solemnly swear. I, Richard Nixon, do solemnly swear. I, Gerald R. Ford, do solemnly swear. I, Jimmy Carter, do solemnly swear. I, Ronald Reagan, do solemnly swear. That I will faithfully execute the office of President of the United States. And will, to the best of my ability, preserve, protect, and defend the Constitution of the United States. So help me God. So help me God. So help me God. So help me God. We, the people of the United States, in order to form a more perfect union, establish justice, ensure domestic tranquility, provide for the common defense, promote the general welfare, and secure the blessings of liberty to ourselves and our posterity, do ordain and establish this Constitution for the United States of America. The presidency is rooted in the Constitution, but its modern dimensions, created by political necessity, were never imagined by the Founding Fathers. Understanding the presidency is vitally important in the success of this great democracy, and that is what this program is about. I am Warren Berger, Chairman of the Commission on the Bicentennial of the United States Constitution. It is a rare occasion in history to have four living former presidents. It has happened only once before, when Abraham Lincoln took office. Our commission decided to interview our four former presidents to record and preserve their views about the office of the presidency and the interaction of the president with the other branches of government, uh, with the people, and with the media. Our interviewer and narrator is the distinguished journalist Hugh Seide, who began covering presidents during the administration of Dwight D. Eisenhower. Gerald Ford, the 38th president, was a congressman from Michigan whose highest aspiration was to be Speaker of the House. The accidental president, he was called. He was chosen to succeed Vice President Spiro Agnew, who had resigned. And Ford was elevated once more when President Richard Nixon resigned. President Ford not only inherited a job he had not sought, he inherited a nation which, at that time, had lost faith in its government. public today have no recollection, certainly younger generations. You remember the, the mob scenes in Washington, D.C., Watts in Los Angeles, the terrible mob scenes in Detroit. Our country was pretty well torn apart. Campuses were not a pleasant place for politicians. You know, uh, our college campuses were in an uproar. So we didn't solve all the problems, but we got people to talking to one another and stop screeching and screaming and yelling at one another. We, I think, moderated the discussion of issues, pros and cons. How did you change the presidency? Uh, we certainly restored public confidence in the presidency. Whether people agreed with me or not, well, I always had lots of opponents, but I never had any enemies. Oh, I had more adversaries in the Congress than I wanted, but I never had any enemies. And a president has to achieve that as well. Mr. Speaker, the President of the United States. The presidency is a powerful office, but the president is not a king. The Constitution limits his power, and so does politics. In the United States, the president does not always get what he wants or accomplish all that he wants to do. The major problem in our government today is the inability of one of the three co-equal coordinate branches to perform its functions responsibly, and that's the Congress. Congress, because of the orgy of reform in the 1960s. 
where they were going to democratize the Congress. They screwed up the capability of the Congress to run its business. Today, the Congress is not a fully operative, successful participant in the process of government because they, they just have lost the capability to manage their affairs. I think it was one of your cabinet officers that told me once he testified 57 times in the course of a few months up on the hill. I mean, I can't see how he could get his work done. In You're exactly right. There are not too many basic committees. I think under the legislation, the House and the Senate have 21 fundamental committees. But the proliferation of subcommittees is unbelievable. I think we now have 200 and some subcommittees in the House and the Senate. And every time you have a subcommittee, you have more staff. The fastest growing industry in the nation's capital in the last 10 years is congressional staffs. They've multiplied, and they're all make-work operations. And I think it uh, adversely affects the capability of the Congress to do its job. One estimate was there were almost 25,000 congressional staff people now. That's You've correct. In everyone. You're almost too young to remember but uh, the, the term before I went to the Congress, Congress had the reform legislation. Prior to that time, they had, I think, 50 or 75 committees. In that reorganization, they established the 21 basic committees in the House and the Senate. And that was a major step forward and was a way in which Congress was able to get its business done. Do you realize the first six years I was in Congress, 49 through 55, we uh, adjourned, finished all our business by July 4th. We, had, we convened in early January and adjourned July 4th. We got all the business done with all these darn staff people and these subcommittees. It's a bunch of make work down there. And the press love it, of course, because they got more people to get leaks out of and et cetera. The president has another tool, too, the veto. I was somewhat surprised when I went back your, over your record, 66 vetoes, of which only a dozen were, up, were overturned. Uh, for Why the, did you, for the time I was in office, I had the most vetoes of any president certainly in this century. And I did it because I had to convince the Congress that their irresponsible spending policies uh, would not be approved by the White House. They finally got the word. And so it was effective. It was effective. It was effective. It took a lot of uh, complaint. You know, the press kept saying when I had veto, well, it's a negative attitude. It's a negative attitude. That's not true. A president has the constitutional responsibility and authority to veto. And if he doesn't use that tool, he's neglecting his presidential responsibility. So, uh, you know, Congress passes a lot of bad legislation without really thinking about it. And every once in a while, a president has to say, you made a mistake. Now go back and think about it. And often, when they think about it, they change. Would you adopt or suggest either of the two constitutional amendments that have, as you know, been kind of uh, echoing back and forth? One is requiring a balanced budget. Secondly, a line item veto for the president. Well, let me take the first suggestion. I'm opposed to a constitutional amendment to balance the federal budget for two reasons. First, most people who advocate it haven't read it. The proposal says Congress and the White House should establish a statement for a balanced budget every year. 
Well, what's the impact of a statement of a balanced budget? It's how you achieve it. Now, the drafters of that amendment ran into a problem. If they make it too tight, then if you have a war or depression where you need flexibility in the budget, that flexibility doesn't exist. So you don't want to have it too tight. If you make it too loose, then what do you do? You provide loopholes. And you and I know the Congress is a master at exploiting <laughs> loopholes. So from a practical point of view, it, it won't work. And the same is true as far as the line item veto. I would favor a line item veto, but I don't think you're going to get a constitutional amendment through the process. You know, our founding fathers never really considered that we might end up with one party in charge of the Congress and one party in charge of the presidency for such a long time. And in our time, as you know, it seems almost gridlocked now. I think the major problem we have today is the inability of the Congress to carry out its constitutional responsibilities promptly and effectively. And uh, the House is the weakest link. The House has lost a lot of its stability, strength, and character. It's now become an incumbent's house, not the people's house. Because 98% of those who run for re-election are re-elected. That's not healthy. We need competitive congressional districts. Now, there's one other problem. Politicians, both Democrat and Republicans, when they redistrict, like to go back in smoke-filled rooms. And I did this three times when I was in the Congress. They make deals. They say you get so many safe Democrat seats, and in return for those safe Democrat seats, we'll give you so many safe Republican seats. Well, the net result of that is the public gets screwed. You only end up with about a third of the seats that are competitive. That's wrong. All of the seats, to the degree possible, ought to be competitive so that the public gets a chance to make changes. Now the th second problem is perks. Uh, an incumbent member of Congress, the House, has 19 employees paid for by the public uh, treasury. No challenger can hire 19 people to work for him, to compete. And the last thing is PACs, Political Action Committee. They strongly favor incumbents. And uh, I would do away with political action committees because it's become very abusive. Throw it open? I'd just eliminate political action committees and make people contribute on their own, not through a corporate organization, not through a labor organization. If they want to give to a candidate or to a party, they ought to do it directly. Well, now, would you change the terms? No, for senators no, and congressmen, no. you'd leave those. There's quite a move on, as you well, well know, among certain people. I vigorously oppose it. I hope it never happens. Uh, our forefathers were very smart. President four years, a senator six, and member of the House two years. Would you limit, though, members of Congress? Now, let me long? answer the first question first. There's a move to make a member of the House four years rather than two years. Having gone through 13 campaigns, I loved to campaign. And I thought it was good for me and my constituents. Now, if you, if you go from two to four years, it helps the politician. He only has to campaign every four and every two years. But what does it do to the voters? It cuts in half, in half, their control over one branch of their government. I happen to believe the House of Representatives is the people's house, not the politician's house. In your time, you knew about the Iron Triangle, Congressional, 
committees, lobbies, and then the bureaucracy. I gather you, you would say that's grown bad. It's gotten worse. Uh, you get this uh, iron triangle. They can either promote legislation, but more emphatically stop it. You have the bureaucrats that like the jobs that relate to laws. You get lobbyists who get paid to keep the laws. And you get the members of Congress who have control over the operation of laws. And you put those three together, they're a nefarious, undesirable part of our system in the nation's capital. Whether a president likes it or not, the Congress has its own ways of dealing or not dealing with items on the national agenda. Even in the best of times, a president often feels frustrated by the legislative branch of the government. All the more so in times of international crisis, when the Congress and the president disagree on matters of foreign policy. Such was the case with President Ford in the final days of the Vietnam War. In January of 1973, there was an agreement between the North Vietnamese and the United States government uh, to end the war. The North Vietnamese were supposed to take their troops out. We were going to withdraw our forces, which we did. Unfortunately, they did not. They kept their forces in South Vietnam. And by March of 1975, uh, they were overwhelming the South Vietnamese military forces. Uh, the big question was, could we uh, supply the South Vietnamese military with enough armament, et cetera, to uh, keep the North Vietnamese from taking over? I asked the Congress for the necessary money. Congress turned it down. And the net result was, in uh, April and May of 1975, uh, the South Vietnamese were being kicked all over by the North Vietnamese, and Saigon was surrounded. And uh, eventually, as you well know, uh, we were totally thrown out of Vietnam. Was that a painful moment for you? Those well, pictures let me tell of you, the... sitting in the Oval Office and watching live the uh, American civilian and military forces being kicked out of Vietnam was not a pleasant experience for a president of the United States, because all of our military, all of our civilian personnel, plus a uh, great many South Vietnamese who had been helpful and loyal to us, uh, we took a shellacking. That raises another point about the use of media around the world, both benefits and disadvantages. Seeing wars on the night news is tough. Do they, does it create some problems for a president? That sort of broadcast? Well, there's no question. Uh, the uh, aggressiveness of the media, particularly the electronic media, to compete with another network or another group to get a shot, the more gruesome, the better. Uh, it has an impact on American public opinion. In May 1975, a Cambodian naval vessel fired on the American merchant ship Mayaguez in the Gulf of Siam. The Mayaguez was forced into a Cambodian port and the crew held hostage. President Ford, without consulting Congress, ordered a rescue operation. U.S. Marines stormed ashore, American warplanes attacked targets in Cambodia and sank three Cambodian patrol boats. Three helicopters were lost. 41 American servicemen were killed, but the Mayaguez and its crew of 39 were set free. It was all over in less than a week. One Monday morning, they brought to you the story of the Mayaguez. Here's a U.S. merchant ship filled with paint, other non-lethal things, going from Hong Kong to Thailand, boarded by the Cambodians, uh, and you instantly took action. Why? The United States had taken a licking on a worldwide basis because we had obviously uh, lost the war in Vietnam and there was 
no question in my mind that we had to take a strong affirmative posture in order to reassure our allies and at the same time to tell our adversaries that we meant business. This was intuitive almost from the start. Well, that was my intuitive reaction, yes. But it was, I distinctly felt, the right course of action for the United States in light of what had happened in Saigon, in Vietnam, and um, elsewhere. We decided the proper military course of action to bring in some Marines, to get some Navy vessels, uh, an aircraft carrier on the scene, plus um, Air Force uh, aircraft from the Philippines. So in a relatively short period of time, uh, the Defense Department reacted effectively and very promptly. But now some people did at that time criticize you because there were 41 deaths, including that helicopter that crashed, uh, ferrying troops. Uh, for 39 crewmen, you got all the crewmen out alive. Uh, some suggestion that maybe they would have been released anyway. You never know whether they would have been released. Uh, I happen to believe the Cambodians released them because they knew we were mobilizing military forces that if they didn't release them, we were going to clobber them, and we would have. There's another issue here that uh, comes through the Mayaguez affair also, the need for covert action, secrecy. The need to have an apparatus, CIA, whatever, that carries out secret missions. Has that diminished? There's been a change in the atmosphere in that regard because Congress has gotten more and more involved in the day-to-day -day operations of our intelligence organizations. When I was in the Congress in the 50s and 60s, I was on a committee that handled the budget for the CIA. There were only seven of us, four Democrats, three Republicans. And we were under the greatest pressure to keep whatever actions the CIA did very, very much off the record, out of the press. And our staff, as I recall, was limited to three. So there were seven members of the House, three staff people, and that was it. Today, uh, you have a House Committee on Intelligence. What are there? Probably close to 20, 21. The staff, probably 10, 15. You have a Senate Committee on Intelligence uh, with a staff. The net result is uh, the CIA has to lay on the table to all of these people and the propensity of people, human nature being what it is, you have leaks of very highly classified information. I don't think that's healthy. I don't think it's in the national interest. You think we ought to have a co covert capability at all Absolutely. times? Absolutely. Uh, we have to carry out certain critical functions without there being a public record as to what's being done. What about leaks, particularly in foreign well, leaks policy? Leaks are uh, very frustrating to people who have a responsibility. It's a combination of uh, people in the government, either in the executive branch or the Congress, who want to curry favor with the press. And the press, on the other hand, wanting to get a story. The National Security Council, which after the Mayaguez came to your attention, you called immediately. Does that structure still uh, function in today's world? I think the uh, basic structure of the NSC is sound. You have to go back and read the legislation when the CIA was first established. I think it was 1947 when uh, we set up the Central Intelligence Agency. Congress passed the CIA authorization bill. As a part of that, 
they also established the NSC. The feeling was that a president needed an independent think tank in the White House so that when a recommendation came from the Defense Department, the State Department, the Treasury, a president wasn't captive of the bureaucracy in the government. He had an independent group of thinkers who could take those proposals from the different departments, analyze it, and give him an independent judgment. That theory is still good, and I think it's now operative. Mr. President, you were somewhat criticized by some members of Congress because they said you hadn't used the War Powers Act correctly, or you had not consulted with them enough, that you'd simply told them what you were going to do. Now, this is a very ticklish issue throughout your presidency and later, too, about how much authority should you have and should you take in times like this? Well, I probably should say at the outset before I answer your question, when I was in the Congress, I voted against the War Powers Resolution, I voted against the conference report, and I voted to sustain President Nixon's veto. So I never thought that the War Powers Resolution was good legislation. Is it unconstitutional? Some I say believe it is. so. I believe so. As a matter of fact, uh, there is uh, a recent Supreme Court decision, the so-called Chatta case, which says that a major provision of the War Powers Resolution is unconstitutional. Uh, it's never been tested. The facts are that since the War Powers Resolution became law, I think there are 17 instances where you could argue that the War Powers Resolution is operative. I denied it as being operative about five times. And I think today most thoughtful members of Congress, Democrat or Republican, would agree that it ought to be modified or repealed. Well, now, you conferred with leaders, though. Oh, yes. The War Powers Resolution says you should notify, you should confer, and you should do certain other things. We went through the notification process. Any president would notify Congress. We conferred. Any president ought to confer with members of Congress. The problem is what you do after that. While President Ford thinks the War Powers Act may be unconstitutional, some experts believe presidents usurp the constitutional power to declare war given only to Congress. Short of a Supreme Court clarification, presidents define the Constitution by their very actions. They may not be clearly constitutional, but for all practical purposes, they are not unconstitutional. The Constitution gives a president adequate authority. It is the action of members of Congress or the Congress as a whole that has an adverse impact on the capability as a president, commander in chief, to carry out his functions. Uh, you're very familiar with what the Congress did during the Vietnam War uh, after they passed the Tonkin Resolution, which in effect gave President Johnson unlimited authority, then they kept backing off, getting less and less enthusiastic. And finally, over a period of time, they kept uh, putting on appropriation bills, uh, limitations which said that uh, no more than 90 days after this date can American forces be in Vietnam. Well, uh, Congress has the right under the Constitution to um, limit expenditures. Whether that right in a time of war is a proper utilization of that power is a question. Because if Congress says after a certain date you can't have forces or otherwise act, it gives to the enemy, it gives to the enemy a added weapon. In other words, Congress helps the enemy by that kind of action. 
Seldom is a president's role in foreign affairs more visible than when he goes to the summit. Shortly after taking office in November of 1974, President Ford went to Vladivostok to talk about strategic arms limitation. He held two days of face-to-face, man-to-man negotiations with Leonid Brezhnev, the leader of the Soviet Union. We had, uh, I thought, uh, constructive negotiations. We narrowed uh, the differences between the United States and the Soviet Union to two points. One, uh, the backfire uh, aircraft that the Russians were developing, and two, uh, uh, surface-to-surface missiles. As I remember, you and Henry Kissinger were walking in the snow to discuss the, uh, your moves in that uh, chess game. It was a most unusual moment. The brand new president, there was considerable worry by people. Well, as you may remember, we held our negotiations at a Soviet Navy Rest and Rehabilitation Center that had been closed, but they reopened uh, for this particular uh, summit. You assumed it was bugged. And we not only assumed, we knew it was bugged. (laughs) So in order to uh, discuss the negotiations for the next day or the next meeting, Henry and I would not stay in the residence where we were housed, but we went out in the snow and the cold of Vladivostok in November so we could talk uh, without uh, being uh, bugged by the Soviet Union. The most interesting sideline of that meeting, and I think it shows a different character of Brezhnev. He was tough, he was a typical Russian, he was hard-nosed, But after we finished our uh, luncheon that last day, he asked me if I wanted to go in to see Vladivostok because the Navy uh, R&R facility was, what, 10, 12 miles outside of Vladivostok. I said, surely. So we get into a big Soviet black limousine. We're driving around, and on the way back, I'm sitting here and Mr. Brezhnev there, He reaches over and grabs my left hand. Well, I'm not accustomed to uh, holding hands with males in back seats of limousines, so I was a little surprised. And then he started to talk. He said, you know, Mr. President, both you and I served in the military. I was in my forces, and we lost many millions of Russians in World War II. And you and America lost I don't know, of seven, eight hundred thousand. He said, we have an obligation to do something to prevent a third world war. He said, I can commit to you, as long as I'm alive, we will not engage in a world war like our predecessors did. And you felt he was sincere? I felt he was sincere. Now, that was a totally different personality from the one who sat across from me in the negotiating table. It was a personal expression of his inward feeling. Now, a lot of people will discount that, but I happen to think it was an illustration. How much responsibility does an American president now have for Americans abroad with literally hundreds of thousands of people Americans living abroad, doing business, how can we protect them? Well, right from the very beginning of our country, there has been an acknowledged responsibility of an American government for the life, the safety of Americans abroad. Now, that's a concept. And uh, we've had a number of incidents where American presidents have taken strong action to recover uh, Americans who were held abroad against their will. On the other hand, there comes a time when a president has to balance the overall goal and objective of an American foreign policy in a particular situation 
with the lives and the safety of Americans who have on their own decided to go abroad. When an American goes abroad, he expects his government to give him protection. But he also has to understand that there may be circumstances, maybe, where the commander in chief has to balance the lives and safety of one or more Americans with the overall goal and objective of an American foreign policy. Many Americans picture their president alone in the Oval Office, burdened by the awesome concerns of the nation and the world, agonizing over a major decision. But the lonely decision is reached with the assistance of a crowd of advisors, a group President Ford inherited from President Nixon. The first cabinet meeting, I asked everybody to stay on temporarily. I thought we had to have some continuity. And one of the first that demanded attention and probably change, Al Haig was the uh, chief of staff for President Nixon. Al wanted to leave. He was worn out. He had gone through Watergate, and he was just uh, at wit's end, really, with all the pressures he had gone through. And I felt I needed my own chief of staff. So uh, I quickly uh, drafted Don Rumsfeld, who was uh, our representative at NATO, brought him back, and after about a month, uh, he took over from Al Hay. And then we gradually made other changes, but I didn't feel that it was wise just to throw them all out. We had to have continuity, and on a one after one basis, uh, we made changes. I didn't want any people in my cabinet who were just yes people. I wanted them to be knowledgeable, people of integrity, people who would speak up with their own views, whether they agreed with mine or agreed with their other cabinet members. And that's what I finally put together. I gradually made other changes so that I had people that I had trust in who not only were knowledgeable but articulate and would speak up when they uh, had a viewpoint. Should a vice president have more to do, uh, Mr. President, to maybe relieve you from uh, some of that uh, junketing and travel? Well, you can't write a prescription uh, for a vice president. Uh, I picked, in my judgment, a first-class one in Nelson Rockefeller. I gave him duties. I turned over to him a major responsibility for domestic uh, programs. Every president makes his own choice, assigns duties as he sees fit, because there's nothing in the Constitution that outlines the uh, responsibilities of a vice president. Do you, you, you feel that you should have that flexibility as president to assign the man the way you would like? Yes, I do. Uh, and every president, every vice president has to redefine. There are only a very limited number of duties a vice president has under the Constitution. One, to preside over the uh, Senate, and number two, to succeed the president. Twice in one month, President Ford's life was threatened by would-be assassins. On September 5, 1975, Lynette Squeaky Fromm, a member of Charles Manson's murderous cult, pointed a pistol at the president in Sacramento, California. Seventeen days later, in San Francisco, Sarah Jane Moore fired a single shot at the president. She missed by about five feet. Twice, within a short period, people took shots at you. How do you live with that? Well, you can't do anything about it. And I uh, certainly was surprised when uh, the Manson girl uh, took a shot at me, or tried to, in Sacramento. 
And uh, I was equally surprised when Sarah Jane Moore tried to do it in, or actually took a shot in San Francisco. On the other hand, I had been a bit prepared because I had been appointed by Lyndon Johnson to the Warren Commission. And that commission, as part of our trying to understand why Lee Harvey Oswald took a shot and assassinated President Kennedy, had a study made in depth of all of the people who had either assassinated or attempted to assassinate a president. And we found that with one exception, assassins were mentally faced with some problem. These people are loners. These people are oddballs. And there's no way the Secret Service, for example, can keep track of every oddball, every loner all over the United States. You cannot be forced to isolate yourself in the White House just because there's some nut out there that might try to shoot you. You have to understand that part of your job is being a part of the people. Do you have to travel? You have to travel, you have to be in crowds, and you have to assume that maybe some nut out there is going to uh, take a shot at you. Mr. President, there are, as you know, some experts who say the media has become almost a branch of government now. It is so pervasive, it affects the rhythm of the White House and the Congress every day. What's your attitude on that? Well, presidents have to learn to live with the press, whether it's right or wrong. I happen to think uh, the press today has an abnormal influence on the public, and through that impact, the press has an abnormal influence on the White House and the Congress. In what ways? Could it be specific? Well, they develop opinions, they develop prejudices of the public by the way they report the news. And the public then responds. And members of Congress and the presidents respond to the public uh, views. A president is a public figure, a national celebrity. As such, he is the inevitable target of the world's comedians and cartoonists. No human foible goes unnoticed. There were some awful tough cartoons about you, Mr. President. How did you take the criticism? How do you deal with that? Oh, I got used to it. Of course, the thing that I really used to laugh about, but I, I guess subjectively objected to, you know, every time I'd ski down one of these mountains and take a spill, uh, that would be the picture. You were night news then. Not that I could navigate the toughest slopes, uh, or if I bump my head, some commentator would make some comment. Well, you know, you get uh, immune, I think, after a period of time. <laughs> you let it roll off. Yeah, yeah if, if you let those things bother you, you're, you're getting your focus on the wrong thing. What qualities like boldness, courage, intelligence, experience, patience, compassion? Is there one that stands out that served you well in this time? I think it's vitally important that a president uh, have a reputation as a person who is no question about his integrity, no question about his knowledge of the processes of government, no question about his intellectual capability to analyze new problems that are inevitably going to arise. The president has to have a reputation of judgment because you get differences, legitimate differences of opinion on any subject, any subject, and you have to Expect a president to be able to analyze the pros and cons and come to a responsible, effective, final, ultimate decision.
Well, if you could change one or two things about the office, what would they be? You could just wave a wand and say, you know, let's make it this way. Well, I wouldn't go to a six-year term. A four-year term, if you get a good president, you can keep him in for another four. If you get a bad one, you can throw the rascal out. Why subject yourself to a six-year experience where you've got a bad one and the public occasionally makes a mistake? So four years, four years, and I would do away with the uh, limitation on two four-year terms. The 22nd Amendment, I you have to drop that. The public ought to have the right to make the choice. And basically, over the years, they've made pretty good choices now. Uh, does a president, you weren't in that position, but does a president lose power then, knowing that he's going to be out of office at the end of his second term, like no Eisenhower question. or uh, or Reagan? No question. When you become a lame duck, you don't have the same power, same influence on the Congress, on programs and policies that you do when you're newly elected. That's the way the game is. So I would keep the four-year term. I would do away with the two-year term limitation. Uh, I wouldn't basically change the Constitution. I think it's worked pretty well over 200 plus years. Uh, Be cautious about that. I don't yeah, the, we've made a few mistakes uh, in how we run the government, but I don't think it's the problem of the Constitution. I think it's a problem of people. What was your greatest disappointment? A president cannot turn a switch and overnight reduce unemployment, cut back inflation, reduce interest rates, solve a recession. The public has the impression that the, a president can do something overnight automatically by saying something or adopting a policy. The world in which we live doesn't operate that way. A president cannot expect instantaneous results. The greatest disappointment to me was that the recession I inherited, I couldn't turn around the next week. We had to have a policy that was right and then be patient enough to wait for the good news. And we did. But in the meantime, you catch a lot of hell. And uh, you just have to sit there. And that inability to solve something uh, by what you say or what you do overnight is probably the, most, the greatest disappointment. Mr. President, certainly one of the most difficult things you did, and one that perhaps had the greatest politi political impact on you, was pardoning Richard Nixon. Can you? Tell us a little about that, on how, how soon you decided that you had to do that. Well, I became president August 9, 1974. And as you well recall, I inherited some pretty serious problems. We were in the process of losing the war in Vietnam. We were faced with all the difficulties of Watergate. Uh, we were on the brink of a serious recession that materialized uh, the worst in the post-World War II era. Uh, we weren't sure what the reaction would be by our adversaries, the Soviet Union. Uh, we weren't clear what uh, our allies felt with a new government under these circumstances. So. Uh, I had a full platter of problems, and yet when I went to the, I think the first or second press conference after becoming president, 75% or more of the questions that came from the Washington Press Corps, what was I going to do about Mr. Nixon? Was I going to pardon him? What would I do with the tapes, etc.? And as I walked back from the that press conference, which, as I recall, was about the 1st of September, I said to myself, 
is this going to be repeated press conference after press conference after press conference? Well, about that time, I looked at my schedule. And I found that I was spending 25% of my time listening to lawyers from the Department of Justice and lawyers from my own White House staff telling me what I should or shouldn't do about Mr. Nixon's papers, about his tapes. And I thought, isn't that a bad allocation of my time as president? Shouldn't I be spending 100% of my time on how to end the war in Vietnam, how to take care of the problems of Watergate, how to handle the economy, how to deal with our allies, how to deal with our adversaries. I should spend 100% of my time on those problems, not 25% of the, my time in the White House on the problems of one man. There weren't any precedents, though, were there? No, but I knew that I was not doing justice to the problems that involved 230 million Americans because I was concentrating, not by choice, on the problems of one man. And I said to my staff, find out how I can get rid of that problem so I can totally devote my efforts to the problems of 230 million Americans. You have to decide what you're going to do on the basis of what you think is right. Uh, the worst kind of a president would be one who looked at polls every day and then decided what to do because public opinion fluctuates uh, from morning to night. You, you have to have a better understanding. And if you uh, think you're right, you have to sell what you're trying to do. Uh, a president has to understand people, and he has to understand the process. That, of course, is easier said than done. But at the heart of any successful presidency is conviction and the courage to tell the people, as Gerald Ford did, what he believes is right.